Welcome to the Teach Joyfully podcast, where we talk about all things elementary teaching with some mom stuff thrown in. I'm Lisa Burns, and I'll be your host. Thanks for joining me. Today, we're talking about classroom management, how to handle students who interrupt. This is an age-old problem. Oh my goodness, who hasn't had this problem in their classroom is actually the better question. Let me tell you a little story. I was working in a small private school. The teacher had asked for my help in managing students who were constantly interrupting. Interrupting other students, interrupting during independent work time, interrupting the teacher when she was trying to teach in small group time. You get the idea. I'm sure you've been there. So I came in and observed for a bit as they went about their normal routines. Now when I do that, I'm not there to judge anyone. I'm just getting the lay of the land so I know where the problems are and where to begin assisting a teacher to find solutions that will work for them. Every teacher, every class, and every school system are different. We have to make adjustments based on real people and real situations. Well, it didn't take me long to figure out that our teacher friend had done everything right to set up her system so beautifully, except for a few small details. She had not spent enough time training her students, and she had hoarded all the control for herself. Now we all know, teaching is fast-paced. It's hard enough to find time to eat, much less go to the bathroom. You have to have a plan ready every day to hit the ground running for everything. You know when you're prepared. You feel it when you walk in the door. It's just a different kind of a day, right? Well, multitasking doesn't work, so we have to focus. We have to be able to stay focused most of the time to help our students reach their potential and to meet the learning targets. That means all those interruptions really are causing us to switch tasks every few minutes to do something else or to focus on something else, which means we have to go back, refocus, and then get back into the task. It's tons of wasted time. So not only is all of that interrupting frustrating, it's a huge time waste. We don't want fractured attention for us or for our students. Think about this. You're in small group teaching with independent work going on in the classroom. It's impossible for you to really teach effectively without doing any small group instruction. You know this, but it's also hard to get any small group instruction done when students are constantly interrupting either you or interrupting other students during their inter- their independent work time. It makes it nearly impossible. So quite often, as teachers, we give up. And I don't want you to give up on that small group time. And I don't want you to give up on all of the great things you want to do in your classroom simply because interrupting is a problem. I know it feels like you can't get into the groove. Your system is broken. We've all been there. Really, you're not alone. But here's what to do. Identify the breaks. What kinds of things are students interrupting you for? Make a list. Prioritize and address each and every one one at a time on different days. Don't lump them all together on one day. We need to start over and train each and every one so that they become a habit. We don't want students to have to be constantly reminded what the procedure is. We want them to know it and to do it almost without thinking because it's such a habit. If your bathroom procedure is such that your students have to ask you to go to the bathroom and you have to be directly involved in that decision every time your students need to go to the bathroom, then you're tying up your time and your students are going to interrupt you for that. If that's an interruption that's driving you crazy, then you need to change your procedure. Make it so your students know when they can go to the restroom and when they cannot. Help them have good judgment so that they'll be able to go and take care of it without asking you. You'll have to have a very specific procedure and sure, you'll need to have some way to know where students are at all times. So think that through. Asking for help is another reason why students interrupt. When students are asking for help, yes, you want to help them, but you don't want to be constantly interrupted for help. There has to be a way for students to either sign up or wait in some sort of a virtual line while they get back to their own work. One way that I do this is I have a chart 
and students put a post-it note with their name and they just virtually get in line. They put their post-it note in line so that I know they're the next person if they want. If they're older students, they can kind of put a couple notes about what it is that they're needing help with. If not, it's okay. A name is fine for young students. They can do that. Then in between groups, you can go and help a few students, check a few off your list, and then get back to work. Everyone knows what it is they're supposed to be doing in the meantime while you're getting to them. Then they're not constantly interrupting you and worried that you're going to forget about them because really, that's kind of part of the problem. Students get a little worried that they won't get their turn. So if you have a procedure and they know that you'll stick to that procedure and they and you will get to them, they'll calm down and they can get back to work. Small group and independent work time are the most interrupted times during the day. The second we're unavailable is the second that students desperately need us. Oh, I know, it happens every time. It's just the same when you're a mom. The second you have to go to the restroom, of course your kids are all standing outside the door asking you for things. That's just the way it happens. Well, it's no different in the classroom. Everything is urgent the second that you're not available. So we need to teach our students what is urgent, what is an emergency, and what is not. They don't actually know. Yes, they think they know, and you think they know, but the reality is they don't know. And so we have to teach them that very specifically. Make a list and go through them. Talk through them with your students and really talk about what an emergency looks like, what kinds of things are urgent and need to be told to you right away, and what kinds of things can wait. And if a student has something that they really do want to tell you, have them put a note on a post-it. If they're young students, they can draw a picture to remind themselves what it is that they wanted to tell you. Sometimes they just had an aha moment and they want to share that. And that's wonderful, but now may not be the time. So give them a way to help them remember so that they can do that later. Giving students authority to do certain things on their own is huge. Students want to feel like they can handle things on their own. They love to feel responsible and, and that they have some sort of authority. Giving them permission to go to the restroom on their own during certain times of the day, getting supplies, sharpening their pencil, all those little details are empowering. And they help students feel like they have some sort of buy-in in the classroom and that they're helping things run smoothly. If you can train students so that they feel this way, it really will go a long way in your classroom running smoother and you're not being interrupted for every single teeny tiny little thing. Truly, that just gets annoying. Essentially, you're creating a culture of trust and responsibility. There's lots of ways that we help retrain students without thinking we're retraining them. If your students come up to you in the middle of your group time when they're not supposed to and ask you a question and you answer them, they've just been rewarded for, it, for doing that. If you have a procedure that says no, you know what to do and you ignore them, then they'll go about the procedure as planned. We cannot reward them for breaking the procedures. As soon as we do, then more and more students will start coming up because they see that somebody else got an immediate response. Essentially, we don't want students to get what they want, even though you're frustrated with them. We want them to stick to the program so students are rewarded with our attention. Impulse control. Now, this is a big issue in our schools today. Yes, it's always been an issue, but I think it's bigger than it ever has been. Students simply don't have impulse control. Many students have trouble controlling every single thought and word that comes out of their mouth. It's not intentional. It's just that they act on every thought before considering better options. You need a do-over strategy. Really, truly, this is the best way. If you have a do-over strategy, then you can say, oops, try that again. Students can go back and try it over and do it correctly because what you're doing is you're training a habit. When you do a do-over strategy, you're helping to reinforce the habit you do want over the habit you don't want. So you want students to do things over correctly as often as possible so that it can become a habit. You're creating a pathway in the brain and you want that pathway to be stronger than the pathway they've already have. That is to simply shout out or to interrupt every time they need something. 
This is where autopilot comes in. We're training habits. We're trying to replace old bad habits in the students' brains with new pathways. We really want to create habits so that they will default to the right way as opposed to the wrong way. Bad habits are like water. They'll flow right back in if you don't put something better in their place. So, so often we get students to say, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore, but they don't have anything to replace it with. If they don't have a new habit to replace it with, and we haven't helped them to ingrain that habit, then that old habit's simply going to flow right back into its place and come back all over again. You want less to manage and you want things to just happen. That's the purpose of habits. A habit is something we do without thinking. It's just like driving a car. When you first learn to drive a car, you have to think about every single detail. Buckle your seatbelt, check all your mirrors, all the details. Now you get into your car and you do all those things without even thinking about them. They're a habit. That's how we want things to run in your classroom, that smoothly. So how do you plan for that? Write down all the tasks that you want to just happen and not be interruptions. Think closely about what you're trying to accomplish, the problem that you're solving. Maybe kids, students are needing help when you're in a small group. Maybe they need to go to the restroom, whatever it is. Pick a problem and work that one out in specifics. You want the specific process. Maybe you have a clipboard or a chart that students can put their name on in line for help. And then you'll need a procedure for what to do when they're stuck while they're waiting, something that's productive and appropriate to whatever subject it is that you're teaching at the time. You don't want students to have to scramble around to get what they need in order to get started and get themselves in line. You want them to actually be able to do it in the quickest way possible with the least amount of distractions. You want it to be smooth and easy. Get it done, get back to work. The less they have to scramble around for, the less likely that things will go awry. The point is, it should just happen. In group time, between group times, all those little habits should simply happen. Now here's where teachers sometimes go wrong. They have all these processes in place and they're all ready to go and they're wonderful, except they don't build any time in between their groups in order for them to deal with all these little issues that will crop up. So none of the problems will get handled simply because there's no time. And students start to learn that, so they start interrupting again. Build in some white space, a little bit of time between each small group and every subject or whatever it is that you're doing so that you can handle the issues that arise. If there's no time, it won't happen. This may mean making some adjustments, maybe to group sizes or group times or to your schedule, but it's well worth it. It will mean that you get focused time in that group and it's better than having interruptions. So if that means you need to take a minute from each group, it's well worth your time because you're probably losing more than a minute out of each group with interruptions. So take the time, it's worth it. In order to execute this, You'll need to gather all your supplies, get everything ready, and then model for your class. In modeling for your class how it will work, you actually need to walk through the entire process with your class, which really means that you're all a bunch of actors and you're going to walk through in your places exactly what you're going to be doing at any given time. That's the only way for students to really get a feel for it. I know we can tell them, but if you don't walk through it, it's not going to stick the way it will if you really walk through the whole process. Choose students very specifically to help try it out. Quite often, I like to choose students who tend to interrupt anyway. This is a chance for them to try the process correctly, and it helps train them that little extra bit more, especially the students that are going to need it. I know that seems like a risk, but really, they love it, and they will do a great job for you. You can have them model it correctly, incorrectly, and then correctly again. If we do it that way, then it gives you an opportunity to talk about, oh, was that the right way? And students will have a laugh about it and everyone will understand exactly what the wrong way looks like too. You don't want to do the wrong way more than once, but it's nice to have that model so that students get the idea. Then you also need to take the time to train your students in how to tell you that something is an emergency or something is urgent and how to interrupt you so that you'll understand that. If you don't train this process, then students won't understand. 
You really do need to train it very specifically. I know it sounds tedious. It's so worth it because really, truly, your students will get it. And then they'll know how to interrupt you when you really do need to know something because you don't want to miss the important stuff. Practice, practice, practice. I know we say it all the time. We tell our students, but we need to tell ourselves sometimes too. We need to practice and retrain any time that we're doing something new, we need to practice it till it's a habit. Now, with some classes that may be three or four times, with other classes that may, it may take 10 times or more, you'll have to gauge it by your class. And you're going to have to retrain your students after the only time they've had a long break. If students have been gone, or if they're just having a day where things aren't going well, stop, take a minute, retrain. It's well worth it as opposed to being frustrated all day. Sometimes we all need a reminder. It's okay. So let's recap. Decide what you're training out and what you're replacing it with. Remember, habits are like water. If you don't have something to put in its place, that bad habit will come back. You need your process and prepare any supplies so that everything is simple and easy for students. We want the, They're going to take the path of least resistance, so make your path the one they'll take. Decide when and how. Build in any extra time that you need in order to make that happen on a consistent basis. That means you might need a little white space in between those group times. And create a model and practice, practice, practice. Yes, you're all going to be actors and it's going to be fun. Just make it into a game and it'll be a great time. And everyone will remember it. Stick to your plan. If students try to circumvent the system, don't let them stop them, send them back, give them a do-over. Let's try that again. That's the way to keep it so that it will always be in place. Don't make exceptions unless it's an emergency. So that's it, my teacher friends. We are out of time and I am out of breath. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you like today's episode, I'd love it if you go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and leave a review. While you're there, hit the subscribe button so you'll never miss an episode. You can find the show notes on my website at www.hopeineducation.com forward slash podcast. And that freebie, if you're looking for a system in order for students to be able to check in and get themselves in line, you can also grab that as well. Remember, a happy teacher is a good teacher. Until next time, teach joyfully and take care of you.